So you should have an outline, uh, politics and doctrinal clarification is right on the front uh, pew there. And if you'll just view that a second, you'll see five streams there that I have listed. And this is, this is the way I'm going to pursue the lecture along each one of those streams. But then obviously at the bottom, you do have a bibliography, Timothy Daly Erdman's Handbook to History of Christianity, Bruce Shelley's Church History in Plain Language, and um, History of Christianity, Seminary Notes, Tom Taylor. So I'll often be making allusion to those, and just for the sake of propriety, we will uh, quote that in the proper way. So in this segment, uh, we're gonna pose some questions and state events that will have repercussions through the rest of the survey. That's why uh, on your outline there, there's lines. So the questions will not necessarily be answered in entirety, uh, but I'll leave you with a skeleton to pursue your own study in the future. And as I mentioned before, this, this book is quite good, Church History in Plain Language, it's very readable. But uh, nowadays, uh, in, the, in the tech times we live in, <clears throat> there's a lot of good podcasts online, and you can just refer to that. So while we are surveying people, events, and movements, our, our primary emphasis is applicational. And in a survey, the, the difficulty is uh, trying to be precise with detail. It's, it's difficult because you have to just continue to whittle down events. So I, I've done my best, and for the sake of accuracy, if there are some inaccurate things, well, you can correct me next time. But at this, at this juncture, <laughs> there, there's always a challenge in church history, and a question surfaces, which frankly, I, I've never been able to figure it out myself. In all my years of studying, uh, teaching church history, and I'm an amateur at best at this, but we with what we would call in our tradition now, true church and correct doctrine as, as we define it, compared to the progression of church history as we'll begin to follow it, uh, it always brings up some complications because we can ask the question, well, was this really the true church in some of their distinctives? And just for the sake of clarity, we, we will just use the term <coughs> church, Christianity, quote unquote, as, as the progression of the movement. And we'll, we'll leave a sleeping dog lie, okay? If you have the answer to that question, I, I will be interested in hearing it. And uh, with the morning series we have with Dr. Godfrey, I'd really like to have him answer that question. Uh, how, at what point do you parse off the study of quote church history and say, well, this is the true church, this is the church gone deviant. And like I said, we, we can oversimplify it and just come to the Reformation and say, well, everything was corrected then. But the problem is um, that's, a, that's kind of a broad brush of history and like I said, I, I really don't know the answer to that. I just pursue it as the study of, quote, church history as we know it. So as you have your outline there, um, the first heading, number one, the relationship between the church and the government. So this certainly is a big issue today, and uh, not just the relationship between the church and the government, but the church and the culture. and. Um, we are going to come to a point, and on your outline says 312, their conversion of Constantine, where there's a major shift. So there's quite a big change. The first uh, three centuries or so, there's persecution, and now all of a sudden the church is tolerated, and then later on in that uh, fourth century, it then becomes legal. So this, this is going to bring some challenges but we have to introduce you to uh, Constantine, which is a key figure in church history, and his so-called conversion, as, and I say so-called because it is debated by some, 
But Constantine uh, reigned as emperor from 306 to 337 uh, amidst some challenges, okay? So there's a lot of politicking going on. And he, he finally established rule of the empire under himself in, in 312. But we're, we're going to take a brief look at what the Dali says <clears throat> about his conversion as related to Eusebius. So, and I quote uh, Dali in this uh, handbook for historic Christianity, Constantine's account of the conversion told by the emperor himself to the church historian Eusebius of Caesarea towards the end of a life is well known. Constantine, alarmed by reports of Maxentinius's mastery of magical arts, prayed to the supreme god for help. So Constantine is in the east, Maxentinius is still in Rome, and what I gather, they're rival emperors at this point. The response was a sign across in the noonday sky above the sun, and with this in the words, conquered by this, that night Christ appeared to him in a dream and commanded him to use the presumably Cairo, the initial letters of the name of Christ, as a safeguard in all engagement with his enemies. Constantine obeyed, marched on Rome, confronted Maxentinius, who was miraculously induced to fight outside the city fortifications and conquered. Tradition tells us that, Max, er, that Constantine's forces were much lesser than Maxentinius's, so it's, it's deemed as, let's just say, some sort of miracle. But the point is, Constantine supposedly saw this sign in the sky by this sign, conquer. So the, the result is Constantine himself, quote, becomes a Christian, imperfect at best. So his understanding of Christianity is, is relatively imperfect, but he, he grows in understanding of it. Uh, but he, he favored it, not as necessarily the official religion of the empire, but it was growing in tolerance. So the problem that surfaces now, and uh, you may know some of this being somewhat of a student of church history, with the Edict of Milan in 313, Christianity is now tolerated and most pagan religions are somewhat tolerated. But, but in comes the culture, and that's what we were mentioning uh, and I'm emphasizing as you look across your outline there. So we have candles and incense being brought into the church. We have the veneration of Mary uh, brought into the church, which possibly was stimulated by uh, pagan religions. Some say it was. And we have others. So now we have the, the rising cult of the saints and the rising cult of the martyrs. So you, you can see this tension beginning to develop here where, if you want to call it this, is a wor worldliness, if you want to say it that way, is, is now coming into the church. Now, it's not that this came in uh, uncontested. There, there was some pushback. And I'll quote again from Dali, uh, from uh, an obscure priest, uh, and I quote, Vigilantis, an obscure priest from Aquintine wrote, we almost see the rites of the pagans introduced into the churches under the pretext of religion. Ranks of candles are lit in full daylight. Everywhere people kiss and adore some bit of dust in a little pot wrapped in precious fabric, etc. So Vigilantis' protests survive only because some outraged priest sent a copy to Jerome who refuted it in a sacramental reply. So with this incursion of some of these customs, it's, it's not that they weren't contested by some, but it, it was the general movement at that time. So this, this opens up a new phase in the church. So it's the emperor's jurisdiction in the church. He's trying to mediate or palicate to Christian and, and pagan alike. And even in the Arian discussion, which we've talked about in previous lessons, he, he was trying to nurture or foster a, a via media. But what, what is critical about this 
Constantine's so-called conversion, uniting the empire under himself, is that the political power shifted to the east from Rome. Uh, and there's now a, a beginning of tension. So the political power has shifted to Constantinople, but we will see rather rapidly that the uh, political power in Rome will increase as well. So Shelley says this, Constantinople, the church there, and the church at Rome, both headed in different directions. So eventually there's a complete break, and we'll see this uh, next lesson when we talk about the iconoclast controversy in the East. So what's, what's all this mean? Well, it means that now we have the question, what's, what's the relationship of the state to the church? Uh, to, to what degree do we push back against pagan customs coming in? They had to deal with that. But paganism was eventually outlawed under Theodosius 394. And uh, sacrifices were prohibited, temples closed, private pagan worship forbidden, and ordered subjects to accept the faith of Peter who brought it from Rome. So this, this brings the challenge, as I said, the tension of the state and the church when they cross over to how, how do we uh, interpret that? Constantine believed in the state as the bearer of religion because it's directly reflected and expressed in the divine will for the world and humanity, human society, end of quote, Shelley. So I'll say that again. Constantine's mindset, as Shelley quotes this, believed in the state as the bearer of religion because it is directly reflect, reflected and expressed in the divine will for the world in human society. So we, we now have a tension. So, so we, we've gone uh, somewhat of a progression and uh, Taylor in his notes makes a good point here. It says, the church has gone in from being branded illegal. Following 13, the, the church was legal, and with the fall of the Western Empire, the church was left to fend for itself in the West, and the Roman church developed itself as their own political unity. And that, that is a very significant point, because while the church in the East is controlled by the state, the emperor, Constantine, at Constantinople, the church in the West, in Rome, now is sort of left to fend for itself. And we'll develop that under point number three, barbarians at the gate. So that's one tension, but another tension is the inclusion of pagan practices into the church. So that's, that's a battle, that's, and that's why I mentioned at the outset some of these themes, we're gonna carry them right through. That's a battle even to this day that we are, are pushing back against pagan practices to some degree, or pagan influences for that matter. So that brings us to the next trajectory, if you have your outline there, that's point two. And uh, this is doctrinal clarification. And we touched on this a little bit last time of bringing up some individuals who are, were overtly apostate. But uh, this is not a relic of the past, okay? So all, all you have to do is get on television and watch the popular series, quote, about Jesus, and you should be asking some questions, okay? And one of the main questions is, who is the real Jesus? Is this series, which I haven't watched, but are they presenting the real Jesus? Uh, is it uh, somewhat of a Jesus, or is it a biblical Jesus? But for those of you who watch this, you can be asking the same question. Well, who, who, who is the real Jesus, all right? And the church dealt with this, not just issue, but several other issues with this with the various councils, and I have that here under your outline, doctrinal clarification. So you have Nicaea 325, Constantinople 381, Ephesus 431, Chalcedon then 451. Now, there are other minor, minor councils, and as we survey this very briefly, we're certainly not going to touch on all the issues of these councils. It's, that's in effect a study itself. But we're simply doing it with, with the applicational intent that doctrine is very, very important. And what we believe is critical to faith and practice. 
So the first council of Nicaea, as you have it there, 325, uh, and the heretic on, in the dock was Arius. And we've talked about him before. I mentioned him last year in a lesson that we did with Athanasius. Athanasius and him uh, pitted heads over Athanasius, defended uh, traditional orthodox view of the Trinity as well as understanding of Christ. But Arius, the Arian, as he's called, and we'll work with that term a little later, uh, in this council he was defeated, but he didn't die completely in that sense. That poison continued through the church, uh, the, de the denial of the deity of Christ. But the full deity of the Son was established at Nicaea, among many other things. That brings us to the next council, and if you have your note there, Constantinople 381. Uh, on the, in the dock is Apollinarius, okay? And the issue is the understanding of the humanity of the Son. And Constantinople established that, that the humanity, the full humanity of the Son was established as well as clarifying the deity of the Holy Spirit. Also at this council, the, the creed at Nicaea was refined and accepted. That brings us to another council, Ephesus in 431. And the heretic here is Nestorius. And the, the problem is understanding the union uh, between uh, the divine and human natures of Christ. And this was clarified at this council and then defined. So uh, these, these issues to perhaps the modern church seem a bit, let's just say arcane, but they're not actually. <laughs> They're very, very essential to the understanding of our salvation. It's just that in the modern church, we have a tendency to not proceed after these as, let's just say, vehemently as we should. In some cases, we do. Well, the last one I want to deal with is Chalcedon 451. And the heretic on, in the dock here is Eutyches, and the issue is the distinctiveness and the coexistence of the divine and human natures the distinctiveness and the coexistence of the divine and human natures. And just for the record, uh, William Shedd, uh, two, two centuries ago, has a very good treatise on this in his systematic theology. So this point, as you've seen it here, point two, doctrinal clarification, drives, drives home how essential it is to know what we believe and be continually defining what we believe. And, and the way this happened, as uh, Taylor says, there, there was a void in the church, and then into that void came a heresy, a challenge. And the consequent result was then the clarification by the councils. So that should, that should tell us something. What it should tell us is that we, we need to be teaching the whole council of God. So there are, there are no voids. Now, obviously we can't cover every jot and tittle, but we, we can have a, a, a well thought out theology so that when heresy attacks, we're, we're able to stand against it. So Shelley takes a, a, summarizes this in quite a good way, uh, these councils and their, the contestants against, let's just say, a proper understanding of who Jesus is. And I quote him, he says, in Jesus Christ, true deity against Arius, full humanity against Apollinarius, indivisibly united in one person against Nestorius, without being confused against Eutyches, end of quote. So now, the, just a, a sidestep for an application here, the, the question that we ask is now, who is Jesus, all right? So as you talk of some of these other people in other traditions, and they say, well, we love and worship Jesus, and um, that's when you have to say, well, let's, let's define who your Jesus is. And again, I make allusion to some of the things that you'll see in the public domain, and particularly that series that I mentioned earlier, again, which I'm, I'm not familiar with, but that, that's what would spring up in my thinking, just be very careful in what you're watching and listening to. Point three uh, is the barbarians at the gates. And um, as you look through this, you're, you're just going to see a, a brief survey 
And you'll see some names there, 410, Alaric, 452. Attila the Hun, you're probably familiar with from history. Uh, 455, Gasseric, 476, Odasser. And then at the end, you see a rise of, of the power of the papacy, Leo I to Gregory I. So, so what I mean by that, this, this is just going to be a very, very brief survey of the fall of Rome. Because remember what I said earlier, we have, we have Constantine in the east, up in Constantinople, and then we have in the, in the west, Rome, with no, no standing emperor at this point, because the power has been consolidated in Constantine. So the, the question is, who's, who's going to fill the void in Rome as Rome falls? And uh, we'll lay this out for you, uh, just to quote again from Shelley, his, his description of this, and I quote him, uh, they called Rome the eternal city. For 620 years since the days of Hannibal, Rome had seen no foreign invader outside its walls. Then suddenly in 410, Alarak, the Visigoth leader with his Aryan hordes was besieging the city. And notice how Alarak is described with his Aryan. He was an Aryan and so were his hordes. And again, just to remind you, Arianism was a heresy. It, it denied the deity of Jesus Christ, among many other things. But that, that was his tradition. The storm would soon break, as Shelley says. Everyone knew that. The first peace treaty ventured beyond the wall to bargain with Arians. Alaric, they begged for mercy. They asked for terms. All your gold, all your silver, came the reply. Above all, your German slaves. The Romans continued to plead as the misery within the walls mounted. Finally, the Visigoths charged through the gates, <coughs> excuse me, and plundered the city, temple by temple, palace by palace. Devastation and ruin were everywhere except in the churches. When Alaric proclaimed himself a Christian, inspected the booty, he separated the church treasures from the rest and the soldiers and carried the vessels through the streets to the churches dedicated to Peter and Paul and to leave them there. So that, that's the first attack. The second one, 452, it, by uh, Attila the Hun, is even more significant because in this one, the, the Bishop of Rome, Bishop Leo, comes out to negotiate with Attila. So this is, this is a strong political statement here. The, the emperor was pretty much just lost <laughs> and out of the picture. But here, here comes the, the bishop of Rome out to come to terms with Attila and Rome was spared. Now tradition says that Attila gave him terms because his army was sick and he had some other issues and he withdrew. But, but that, is, that is a very, very significant point. And uh, on your outline again, the next uh, lad in the progression there, 455, Caseric the Vandal, uh, he attacks 455. And again, Leo I comes out and parlays with him and, uh, and there's a 14 day sack of Rome and then they disperse. So, so his power is increasing. And then finally, 476, uh, the barbarian Roman army led by Odasser conquers Rome and gives allegiance to this Constantinople. There are some side acts involved in this, and I'll mention Augustine at the end, and we did him two years ago, but he, he was processing the fall of Rome in his work, The City of God. And that's a study in itself, but there, there was a reaction to it, and to, to, to this day, it still feeds the tension of, of understanding our, our view of human government and the church. But the implications of this political collapse are, are pretty, very critical, and Taylor says this, Leo I, and I quote him, Roman bishop, 440 to 461, succeeded in persuading the emperor Valentinian to give an edict placing all the Western clergy under Leo's administration. And eventually this, as the mere survival of the church, allowed Rome to become the established authority in the West. Uh, 
So you now have in the West, and this is somewhere during his reign between 440 and 461, the West, Rome, the, the power is the church now. Whereas in the East, the, the power is the emperor, the, the government. So again, Taylor says, consequently authority in the West was in practical aspects the church, and in the East was political power. Okay, so remember at the outset, I said these, these issues, I'm going to present them to you, and then we'll, we'll, we'll parse them out as the class goes on in the next segment. But now, now I'll give you a stab uh, at the million, the, what I call this is the, the million dollar question, all right? When did the Bishop of Rome officially become the Pope? All right, now, the term Pope just simply means father. And as I studied this, uh, it's, it's a little bit convoluted and there's differences of opinion on it. But just to define this term, from the third century, the title is used for any bishop in the West. So it's, it's kind of a general term. But the rising power of the Bishop of Rome, you'll see that about 250 or so. And finally, and it wasn't until 1073 or so, that that office was officially called the papal office under Gregory the Sixth. But the, the the growing power of that office could, from what I understand, um, be rec be recognized as well. He's the Pope. The Bishop of Rome is the father, and we will see, and not so much in this lesson, but the next lesson when we start talking about doctrinal controversy. And you, you could see it in some of the councils already where the church in Rome and the church in the East was butting heads over some of the issues of the councils. But we'll really see it during the iconoclast controversy. So the power is escalating, and it, and it finally escalates under Gregory the I, and he's put him about 590 to 604 because he formed the Vatican army and the Roman church, city, state, etc. But more so why Gregory is so significant, and he, he was a very humble guy, he came from a monastic background, which we'll talk about in a minute, but he, he was a very pivotal figure as we move into the Middle Ages a little bit further, next time we'll move fully into the Middle Ages. And this is, this is why I gave you that disclaimer in the beginning, that as, as the church moves in these directions, it's, it's very difficult to parse out, okay, what's, what's the true church? What's the, what's the counterfeit church? Is there true believers in the counterfeit church, et cetera, et cetera? And frankly, I don't know the answer to that, but all I can do is pursue church history as church history. So here's, here's why he's so critical, and Shelley says this, he formulated the common faith of his day and handed it on to the Catholic Church of the Middle Ages. So, so let me say that again about Gregory I. He formulated the common faith of his day and handed it on to the Catholic Church of the Middle Ages. The, the, he was the door. So what you should be asking now, well, what are, what are some of the distinctives of the traditions that he handed down. Well, the teachings of the fathers and the councils, okay, we, we don't so much have trouble with that. But now uh, the fall did not completely destroy human will, and, and this was dealt with in one of the councils back in there, uh, the dealing with Pelagianism. So this, this opens the door for the cooperation with the human will and divine grace, all right? And like I said, this, this Put, sort of puts a cloud on the horizon as we look back on this and say, hmm, that's, that's interesting. But then there's other things, uh, penance for sins after baptism, all right? That was already a growing tradition that baptism of the so-called believer forgave sins up to that point, but afterwards uh, to have forgiveness, there would have to be uh, penance, intercession of the saints, was growing. Power of holy relics, okay, and relics are just bits and pieces of different traditions in the church, uh, whether it's a martyr's hair or something like that, 
uh, the concept of purgatory, all right? And for those of you who are not familiar with that, as, and I'll attempt to explain this the best I can, purgatory is an, an intermediate state in that tradition that if you, if you die and you're not perfected enough to go right to heaven because of your, let's just say, obedience to the church, then you go in purgatory and you will suffer for a while. Purgatory comes from, I think, purgatos. Uh, yeah. So that, again, is a doctrine that we say, whoa, whoa where, where, do, where do we see this? But probably the most prolific thing that Gregory the First carried in was the power of the Mass, okay? Not just the Eucharist in the Catholic tradition, but the power of the Mass. So the Mass, as, and that's what the Catholics would call their uh, church service, per se, uh, has some efficacy to it to those who believe in its efficacy. So this, this can be, and there's a wide range of opinion on this, but it definitely has some power, something to do uh, with the forgiveness of sins, but it also has some authority in getting people out of purgatory. And I oversimplified that, but let's just suffice it to say that that, that is a belief even today in the Catholic Church that the Mass is so critical and important. And like I said, we, we look at the book of Hebrews and we say, hmm, how do we process this? We see the finality of the sacrifice of Christ. And this tradition is saying, well, it's final, but it's not. There are church sacraments, quote, that uh, assist in grace. That's why Gregory is so important, because he now pushes these ideologies into the Middle Ages. So that brings us then to um, point four on your outline, the monastic movement. And I know that this was covered two years ago uh, when Jonathan did a lecture on um, this era, but I'll just briefly touch it because it does bring up an issue. And that's why I said we're, we're really trying to st stick with application in the study. And, and the issue is this, Christianity, was outlawed, then tolerated under Constantine, and, and now it's legal. So in the era of persecution, let's just put it in the first century, 2, 3, 12 or so, uh, martyrs stuck out as, quote, the spiritual ones, and right, rightfully so, but now, now with the shift, there's a new question, well, who, who, are the, who are the super saints? And this, this is not a, necessarily a foreign idea because even Tertullian, Origen, Cyprian sort of intimated, <coughs> excuse me, in their writings, this, this higher level of sanctification, this penance to remove sin, uh, celibacy, uh, the, the hermit lifestyle, Probably, as I have on your outline there in a monastic movement, the first official monastic follower was Anthony. And there's many traditions about him. You can, you can read that in his <laughs> dealing with Satan. But some, some of them were pretty radical, all right? Some of them just uh, ate grass. Others just lived in trees. Probably the illustration of the most radical of these men uh, uh, and women, for say, uh, Simon Stylus lived on a pillar for 30 years. Okay, so he, he built himself a pillar and he sat up on this thing for 30 years and had his food brought up to him. So the, the idea of this, uh, I guess you could say it this way, was in the world but not of it. So by, by removing myself from the world, I could crucify the flesh. And um, while it's somewhat of a noble endeavor, that's not the way we would say to crucify the flesh. This movement gained a lot of traction. And as I have on your note there, 320, a guy by the name of Pacamus, he, he developed the first Christian monastery. And for the next 
five, six centuries, um, this is a very strong movement, this monastic movement. And again, the next lesson we'll see that. But it's, it's Benedict, as I have there, 529, who, who led the movement, what I would say, into maturity. And he established 529, a monastery in Ma uh, Mount Cassio in Rome, and he established the Benedictine rule. So the strength of Benedict's endeavor was he, he had a little bit more balance to the whole movement of monasticism. And it discipline, worship, okay, so seven services in 24 hours, ooh, that, that would be pretty difficult, especially if you're a laborer and, and these monks would work. Uh, they, they were heavy on the idea of labor, but to have seven services in 24 hours, and, and generally, as tradition tells us, they weren't very long, maybe 20 minutes or so long, but I'm not sure I would like the idea of getting out of bed two o'clock in the morning, going into a cold stone chapel and chanting psalms. I, I don't have a problem chanting psalms, but in that context, so that, that was part of it. And these monasteries became self-sufficient. They elected their own abbots, that was the leader. Uh, lots of religious reading and uh, the study of classics as well. And, and this was the strength of the monastic movement. There's lots of weaknesses, but one of the strengths was they preserved the writings of the church fathers and the Roman classics. And they, they set the pattern for the movement into the Middle Ages. Now, we'll talk about this a little bit next week, or next month, how the Irish saved civilization. Uh, and Thomas Cahill has written a book on that. And it, to some degree, the, the retreat of the monastic movement up into Ireland preserved a lot of the learning of the church. But we'll, we'll parse that out later. But that brings another question. Okay, this monastic movement, a desire to try to escape from the world, and the, and the worldly pressures, uh, is that the correct way to mortify sin? And we say, well, it's, again, as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's a noble attempt. However, uh, that's, that's not the way that we pursue it as evangelical believers. And you can consult John Owen's work on that, The Mortification of Sin. That's quite a good work, and uh, get a good, solid theological basis for that. That brings us then to point five on your outline there, and this is, this is what I call the indistinguishable path. And the quote I read in the beginning, uh, to refresh your thinking, <laughs> I'll just take little bits of pieces of it. We, we as the true church today, and understand correct doctrine, as, as we reflect back on the church and its movement, we're, we're asking this question, well, when, when does it start going fully off track? And again, who were there, was there, are there true believers in that tradition? That's a question that I don't know the answer to. But I do uh, know that history tells us to, to be aware of this. And, and one, of the, one of the key things is the movement of missions north. And the, the context is all these barbarian tribes, and these are the ones that have come down and sacked Rome, uh, but they're, they're very much influenced by Aryan missionaries, all right? And probably the most popular one is Euphilus. And it's interesting how Shelley handles this in his church history. He said, well, the, these people embrace this, and he, and he doesn't necessarily come across as saying they were true believers, but they, they embraced it with, with a different understanding of this dilemma. And he says this about the Germans, that to them, Jesus was a glorified warlord, right? So now, now you have them bringing missions up, these, these Aryan missionaries, and remember what Arianism is, Jesus is not, not the eternal Son of God, no Trinity per se, uh, he's a created being. So it's obviously heresy, we would call it that. But they, they bring it up and some of these tribes are converted to this tradition. So our question is, well, did any of these tribes ever rectify themselves in that context to Orthodox Christianity? 
But movements in other areas, for example, the Celts, and you, you're familiar with them because Patrick, supposedly, that's my middle name, being raised in a good Catholic home, um, was the, the, the so-called patron saint of Ireland. And even as I study him, and I've, I've seen various studies of him, what, what faith was he bringing from England over? He was taken off the west coast of England as a slave in Ireland, escaped, came back, and then supposedly had a calling <coughs> excuse me, to return to Ireland. So that in itself is, is another question to, to what exactly was he teaching? And many people would say, no, no, well, he was a Christian evangelizing. And, and again, I, I don't necessarily know the answer to that. All I know is that he is put in that position in church history as being the patron saint, per se, of Ireland and bringing the so-called gospel to them. Well, a lot of these Celtic monks then went over onto the continent and, and spread th that tradition there. So that brings us to another guy, and, and we, we would ask, is this guy another Constantine? And this is Clovis, about 481 uh, or so, and he is uh, up there in Gaul in France, all right? And I'll just read a brief excerpt to, to clarify his so-called conversion, because again, with these mass conversions of these pagan tribes, it does bring up a question. Was it a sociological conversion, uh, or was it a genuine conversion if the doctrine was correct? Again, we just survey it and leave it. But uh, just to read briefly about Clovis here, as I quote Shelley, uh, uh, he was 481 to 511. It happened that he was married to a Burgundian princess who was a Christian. Clotilda often spoke to Clovius about the one God who created heaven and earth out of nothing and had fashioned men. Clovis replied, nonsense. But when their first son was born, he allowed the child to be baptized. The babe died in baptismal robes. Okay, so Clovis then blames the baptism, but Clotilda rejoiced that God had taken a soul directly to heaven to eternal bliss. Another son was born, baptized, and fell sick. Clovis claimed that baptism would kill him too, but the mother prayed and he recovered. Then in a battle with the Alemanni tribe, Clovis was facing a terrible defeat. He cried, Jesus Christ, Clotilda says, thou art the son of the living God, and thou canst give victory to those who hope and give me victory, and I will be baptized. I've tried my gods, and they have deserted me. I call on thee, only save me. The king of Alemanni fell, and his army fled. Clovis returned and told Clotilda, end of quote. So again, <laughs> that brings up this, this dilemma, as I was call it, as we follow the progression of church history, uh, to, what, to what degree were these people actually converted? And um, with these mass conversions, what, what was actually the fruit of them? But not, nonetheless, out of it came uh, the growth in some respects. So with this in mind, I, I'm just going to leave you with some names to consider for further study. Uh, I want to leave you with Augustine, all right? And Augustine, uh, as I mentioned earlier, wrote The City of God in reflection to the fall of Rome. And this is the tension of the worldly city uh, that represents temporal things and, and the city of God in heaven. Uh, church is, a, is a, in his words, a human community working to build the city of God. So again, this is this, is this issue of the, the tension of church and state. He said this, states fueled by the power of sin, so the, the, the state, the government, needs to submit to the laws of the Christian church. So another one, and you're probably familiar with this name, is Jerome, and he's about 345 to 420, and he was a biblical scholar and uh, noted for the, the Vulgate, writing the Latin Vulgate. Next time, uh, we will move into a further consideration of Eastern Orthodoxy, the, the church in the East, and then, and then we'll touch that delicate <laughs> uh, subject of the Crusades, 
all right? And we'll, we'll parse that out and I think give you a much more accurate history of what that was really about. And then, and then we're going to talk about scholasticism, that, that movement in the Middle Age. And then we'll also delve into some of the increasing political uh, gerrymandering and maneuvering as, as a result of the movement of the church, because you'll, you'll hear terms like the Holy Roman Emperor, all right? And that, that will then op open the door to launch us in to the Reformation era, which we'll just do very briefly because we've had enough studies of that here and we've touched on that, uh, but that will just open the door briefly again and then move on with the study. So at this point, this gives us time for, uh, we have some time here, issues for reflection. And the, the first one that I wanna mention is this, uh, legal Christianity, the tension between the church and the state and their relationship. So I uh, just open the floor, uh, I'll shut this off. <clears throat> 